Uh, just to set up some of the context uh, before Jay and I start our conversation. So basically, uh, we now think that AIDS has existed for about 100 years and that it came to the United States in the 1940s and certainly to New York City in the 60s and 70s. But science did not observe the pattern that came to be known as AIDS until 1981. And the first public statement of this was the famous article in the New York Times, July 3rd, 1981, 41 cases of rare cancer found in homosexuals in San Francisco. Now, I want to explain what that headline meant in 1981. So today, white gay man is considered a privileged category by many. In 1981, gay people were a profoundly oppressed minority. Gay sex was illegal. In fact, sodomy laws were not overturned federally until 2003. New York City had no gay rights bill. You could be fired from a job, you could be kicked out of an apartment, you could be denied public accommodation, restaurant service, or hotel. Familial homophobia was the cultural norm and was virulent, and street violence against gay people, which was called gay bashing, was a part of life, and there was no authority that you could turn to for protection. So it was into that environment that this virus came. And there, because gay people were so oppressed and so stigmatized, there was a lot of uh, talk about trying to figure out what caused homosexuality. Today we know that sexuality is different in each person and can change over your life. But at the time, it was thought of as a binary. There was heterosexuality and homosexuality, and homosexuality was considered to be one thing, and many people felt that it was biological. There was a lot of pseudoscience around 1980 about homosexuality being caused by your hypothalamus gland or some kind of bizarre <laughs> biological theory. So when the New York Times said 41 cases of rare cancer found in homosexuals, people thought, oh, this is the biological disease of homosexuality itself. And for those reasons, the first name for the disease was GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. And then it became known as AIDS. The first five years of the AIDS crisis, 40,000 people died, and the government did absolutely nothing. Pharma also did absolutely nothing. Their main concern was trying to recycle failed cancer drugs that they own the patents for. And what they were looking for was like a pill that you would take that would make your AIDS go away. But AIDS is really like an umbrella term, like cancer. It's actually different in each person. Um, and what people with AIDS were experiencing, so. For those of you who are young, AIDS is a terrible death, and people really suffer. And what it means is that your, your immune system is no longer working. So as your immune system breaks down, you start to get these symptoms that were called opportunistic infections. So you could get dementia, or blindness, or you couldn't process nutrition, or skin cancer, or the nerves in your legs would swell. And people with AIDS wanted treatments for these opportunistic infections. But for pharma, there was no motive because the, the market's share was smaller if you tried to develop medications that way. Now, what the gay community did in, those, in that first five years is try to recreate some facsimile of social services. Because you know, gay people's needs were not addressed, people with AIDS needs were not addressed, and familial homophobia was a real factor because a lot of people did not have networks of support. So uh, gay men's health crisis had a Puerto Rican socialist, uh, sorry, social worker named Diego Lopez, who died of AIDS, but he started this program called the Buddy Program, where people would volunteer, they'd be assigned to a person with AIDS, and you'd just like hang out with them or help them do their shopping or whatever. There was organizations that would walk your dog or could bring you food, but there was, it, there was no political movement. What really changed this was a Supreme Court decision, Bowers v. Hardwick that upheld the sodomy law. So right in the middle of this mass death experience, the Supreme Court was like, yes, gay sex should be illegal. And gay people were enraged by this. And there were angry demonstrations in the streets of New York and in Washington, D.C. that were held without permits. And this was the turning point in which you see this politicization. Um, in March of 1987, the writer Larry Kramer gave a speech at the Gay Center on 13th Street. And the audience that attended that speech decided that they wanted to meet again and start a group. And a couple of days later, they did meet, and they started this group, ACT UP, 
AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. In the next six years, which are the years that I cover my book, ACT UP had astounding victories. I mean, it is very hard to find an, a, movement, a movement of people with no rights who were able to achieve so much in such a short time. So I just want to tell you what some of the most incredible accomplishments were. ACT UP forced the government and pharma to change the way they researched medications so that, they, so that opportunistic infections were researched. ACT UP forced the Food and Drug Administration to make experimental drugs available to people who needed them, even if they had not gone through an approval process. ACT UP, in a four-year campaign that Linda Meredith was part of, was sitting right here, forced the CDC and Social Security to change the official definition of AIDS so that women could get benefits and get into experimental drug trials. And I just want to explain that for a minute. In the 1960s, there was a drug given to pregnant women um, that was called thalidomide. And a lot of women had children who were missing limbs. And they sued pharma, and pharma had to pay out these big settlements. So after that, they were like, I know, no women in experimental drug trials. But in those days, those trials were the only way you could get treatment. So women couldn't get into the trials. And because women had symptoms that were different than the symptoms on the official government list, they couldn't get an official AIDS diagnosis, so they couldn't get benefits. So people would actually die of AIDS and never qualify for treatment or benefits. And ACT UP ran a four-year campaign that did overturn this successfully. ACT UP made needle exchange legal in New York City, which transformed the epidemic in New York. ACT UP made it so that HIV was no longer a pre-existing condition for private insurance thereby making private insurance suddenly available to 500,000 people. ACTIP also took on the Catholic Church, and this was at a time was before the priest sex scandal. The Catholic Church was incredibly powerful, and the cardinal had as much or more power than the mayor, and certainly was in office longer. And the Catholic Church was trying to stop condom distribution in the public schools. ACTIP did a demonstration in December 1989 where they disrupted mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And this went all around the world. Homosexuals with AIDS marching into a church and disrupting mass. And the church was unable to stop condom distribution in the public schools. But I think most importantly, ACT UP transformed how queer people and people with AIDS were seen in the mainstream media and how we felt about ourselves. Now, when I was writing this book, it was very important to me that this not be nostalgia. I feel like we're living in a time that is crazy. The wrong people are in power. Many, many communities really desperately need change. And it's very hard to access activist information. It's extremely difficult because the mainstream media coverage is so distorted. So my goal in writing the book was to try to cohere and understand what were the strategies that ACT UP used that enabled them to win these victories? And I lay them out for you with evidence throughout the whole book. So let me just summarize what I think are some of the key takeaways. The first thing, and the thing that I think is the most important, is that ACT UP was not a consensus-based movement. By that I mean people did not have to agree. There was a statement of unity. There was a bottom line of values. But that unity was one sentence. Direct action to end the AIDS crisis. And that was direct action as opposed to social service provision. So basically, if you were doing direct action to end the AIDS crisis, basically you could do it. Now, let's say somebody came in with an idea. So let's just take, for example, needle exchange. That was very controversial at the time. Um, the, the prevalent theory about drug use was that the counter was abstinence. And ACT UP favored a much more complex idea called harm reduction that was just being introduced. David Dinkins was the mayor. He was the first black mayor. The black community did not support harm reduction. They were very nervous about it. And so he did not support needle exchange. And many people in ACT UP also did not support needle exchange. But when they came in with a proposal, people would argue, and we did argue, this was pre-gentrification New York culture. People were very confrontational and nobody was afraid of you. A lot of people couldn't take that though, because that was so <laughs> But in the end, if you didn't want to do needle exchange, you just wouldn't do it. You wouldn't try to stop the people who wanted to do it from doing it. You would go find your own people who wanted to do what you wanted to do and you would do that. 
And this approach, this radical democracy, enabled ACT UP to have so many different campaigns going on at the same time, that there was a simultaneity of action, of campaigns in all different kinds of social milieu, with all kinds of styles and all kinds of aesthetics. And it was this broad uh, approach that is really what created the paradigm shift. And I think that today, when we need big tent politics, where people can work together based on the things they agree on without having to force each other to all agree on the same things. We have a lot to learn from that, though. Because I think historically that movements that try to force homogeneity of analysis or strategy have all failed historically, and I don't think there's any exceptions. So to me, that's the biggest takeaway. But there's some other interesting things as well. So ACT UP is primarily a white gay male organization. Now, of the, the men in ACT UP, the older men had been in gay liberation. But the younger men really, for the most part, did not have any previous political experience. There was a smaller amount of women and people of color who came into the organization, but they had a lot of political experience. So there was a, a significant Latino participation in ACT UP. And this was the time of fascist dictatorships in Argentina and Chile. And there were people who had come from those countries who had been in student movements, or who had been in student movement in Mexico City. Um, and then there was uh, the women who had come from feminism and had a lot of experience in the women's peace movement, in the reproductive rights movement, and in the feminist women's health movement. And they brought in very concrete ideas that really became the centerpieces of ACT UP. For example, one of ACT UP's leaders, Jamie Bauer, and Alexis Stanzig, who's here, where are you, right there, brought in from the women's peace movement the concept of nonviolent civil disobedience training. And this was the centerpiece of the ACT UP experience. Um, one lawyer that I interviewed, Lori Cohen, said that she processed 10,000 arrests, one lawyer, and there were many lawyers. So this was a really important part of ACT UP's culture. Another was that women like Risa Denenberg or Marion Bonsoff or Maxine Wolf, who had come from reproductive rights, brought in the idea of patient-centered politics. Because in the feminist women's health movement, at a time when medicine was controlled by men, women had to look at what did women actually need? What is the woman's perspective to, to determine their agenda? And ACT UP always said people with AIDS are the experts. Everything was looked at from the point of view of people with AIDS. For example, science wanted to have double-blind studies. That means that half the people take a placebo or a sugar pill, and the other half take the drug. Well, if you're a person with AIDS, you don't want that sugar pill. So from our perspective, we oppose that. Now, science, they wanted the clean data, right? So you're looking at it from the perspective of people with AIDS. So even though women were small in number, in many ways, they were theoreticians of some of the most fundamental ideas in ACT UP. But what's very interesting is that people of color and women never stopped the action to insist on consciousness raising about sexism or racism, never. What they did instead, and I think we can learn a lot from them, they had concrete agendas for their constituencies that they were fighting for, and they, ne they kept their eyes on the prize and they marshaled the ample resources of the larger organization for their agenda. So for example, um, some people in ACT UP did an art auction that raised $650,000. When the Latino caucus realized that pe people with AIDS in Puerto Rico needed support, they just went to fundraising and got the money to go to Puerto Rico and they started ACT UP Puerto Rico. When women with HIV needed to go to Washington or needed to go somewhere to testify or to protest, they needed travel money, they needed hotels. That money, we didn't have to raise that money for our constituency. We went to fundraising and got it. So it was a very wise, I think, approach right there. And then, you know, there also there was not a lot of micromanaging. And that's something that's really important to remember. Like, I remember being in a meeting and they would say, somebody needs to write a letter send it to this commissioner. And someone would say, I'll do it. And that was it. You would go do it. Like, there was none of this, like, you must know, this word here. <laughs> had to give up control. The people who in ACT UP, were in ACT UP were very, very committed to being effective. Very. And one of the leaders, Maxine Wolf, always said that you should go action first. Because when you, take, when you go action first, your theory will emerge. Because you have to make decisions about how to do your action. And those decisions make you cohere your values. 
If you go to theory first, then you're all debating things that are empty. They have no application and you can get polarized. And ACTIP was completely action first. So I just want to say one more thing and then I'll turn it over to Jay. Uh, just about the historical position of the uh, AIDS activist movement in terms of the history of the left. You know, I think that the gay movement is falsely seen as discreet, as this like sudden thing that came out of nowhere, but it's not. And there's a lot of reasons. One is that, well, many people in ACTIP had been in previous movements, but they'd been in the closet. So they had ex political experience. But also the left did not want gay people. The Communist Party kicked out gay people, the civil rights movement famously sidelined Mayor Rustin. The feminist movement had numbers of lesbian purges, many of which have not been historicized. So the reason there was an autonomous, separate gay and lesbian movement is because basically nobody else wanted us. It's not because we had any kind of separation ideology. However, there was enormous influence by other movements, and I just want to set this up a little bit. So most people in ACT UP were born in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And as gay children, there was no concept of gay children at that time. Right? So there was no idea like, I'm going to grow up and run away to San Francisco. Like, you didn't know that there was anything out there. But we saw black people on television resisting, and it had a huge impact. We saw black people doing civil disobedience, doing direct action, sitting in at lunch counters, fighting the police. And when I was researching the book, I went back and reread Martin Luther King's 1964 article, Letter from Birmingham Jail, where he famously lays out his concept of direct action. And guess what? It's exactly what ACT UP did. I mean, so basically, we had all internalized it, even though we never discussed it. So let me tell you what that concept is, and then I'll, I'll end. So what Dr. King said, and what ACT UP did, is that first, you become the expert on your issue. So that you're not in an infantilized relationship to power, begging the people in power to fix it, because they're never going to, and they also don't know how, and they don't want to. So you have to become the expert, and people in ACT UP with no science background, no policy background, became experts on housing policy, on drug policy, on, on medicine. And, and they developed the plans for how the FDA could let these drugs be dispersed, or how there could be people change. You know, they designed it. So then you bring your reasonable, winnable, and doable plan to the powers that be. And when they say no, you do what Dr. King called self-purification, or what ACT UP called nonviolent civil, civil disobedience training. And you go forward with a theatrical but nonviolent action that communicates through the media to the public what your solution is, how reasonable it is, and this puts pressure on the institutions. And that's called a campaign. So what ACTIP would never do is make people stand in the rain at a demonstration with signs by someone standing on a stage giving a speech. Because it's disempowering and it doesn't lead to anything. The entire body was informed. There were um, teach-ins all the time. It was a very sophisticated rank and file. Anyone could be a spokesperson. You know, they didn't, the media didn't have to go to special spokespeople. Jamie disagreed with me. He was the media chair. <laughs> um, so everybody was a participant. And so each action led to another step towards the demand. There was no action that was just there to waste your energy in that moment. And so it was based on a campaign structure. So that's my introduction, and let's see what Jay has to say. And thank you so much. Woo!